All right. Welcome, everybody, to uh, our, our panel discussion today around ESG goals with SolarEdge. I'm uh, John Hulse. I'll be the moderator today, and I've got an excellent uh, group of panelists here with me. Um, a few housekeeping rules to before we get started here. Um, well, I guess we'll talk about the agenda first, but uh, we'll do a quick round of introductions get into the, the Q&A of ESG and sustainability, net zero trends happening in, in the market today. Um, and then we'll we'll try to leave uh, five, 10 minutes at the end for any questions uh, that any attendees have. So definitely appreciate everybody making time to, to, uh, to join today's conversation. Um, everybody's uh, on, on mute with the audio. Um, if you do have questions, there is a little dialog box uh, where you can type in those questions. If we, at the end of this panel discussion, we don't get to all the questions, uh, we will respond uh, to those. And then we'll also send out the recording of, of today's uh, discussion. So um, quick introduction on myself. Uh, my name is John Hulse. I'm the commercial sales manager for SolarEdge. I'm based in St. Louis and I've um, been in the industry uh, over a decade now, uh, coming up on almost nine years here at SolarEdge specifically. Uh, the last four and a half, five years, uh, all on the commercial industrial side of the business. So lots of interactions with uh, enterprise accounts, developers, financiers, asset owners, installers, design engineering firms, et cetera. So um, I will go around the table here and, and get introductions. Um, Dr. Aurora, let's uh, might as well start off with, we'll go in alphabetical order. How about that? Sure. Uh, Aurora Sherrard, Executive Director of Sustainability at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I've had over 20 years in the built environment, so I don't really know when solar came into that, but it, it's been a while since I've been in the building and, and infrastructure industry. Uh, been at the University of Pittsburgh for five and a half years. Uh, if you're not familiar with Pitt, uh, it's located in the city of Pittsburgh. We have four regional campuses, but just on our Pittsburgh campus, uh, we have almost 30,000 students. Um, we're the third largest business district in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uh, behind um, downtown Philadelphia and downtown Pittsburgh. Uh, we have about 15 million uh, square feet. We have a goal to reach carbon neutrality uh, by 2037, which includes 100% renewable electricity produced or procured. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining and uh, partaking here. So we'll go next. CJ. How's it going, everyone? CJ Calavito, Vice President of Engineering at Standard Solar. I've been in the solar energy industry for 16 years and spent 15 of those with Standard Solar. My first year was spent uh, doing some sustainable development volunteer work in Nicaragua. Um, I got my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Virginia Tech and uh, I've got some solar certifications, including my NAPSEP certification, which I'm sure many folks attending are familiar with. Um, at Standard Solar, we're an independent power producer, but we started as a regional developer and engineer procurement construction company. Uh, I moved into the long-term ownership and operator role back in 2017. About a year ago, we were acquired by Brookfield Renewables, which is a very large uh, global asset management company um, that owns over 70 billion in renewable energy assets and uh, uh, companies throughout the, the world. Um, Standard Solar has over 500 megawatts of projects, either in operation or under construction across more than 20 states in the US. Um, and all of our efforts are focused on distributed generation solar and community solar projects. Awesome. Extensive background, CJ. And last but not least, Stuart. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Stuart Flanagan, uh, principal and co founder of Newport Renewables, based in Rhode Island. Uh, I've got about 14 years of experience in the solar industry, starting out way back when the, the resi, resi front and uh, quickly grew into commercial and industrial projects. Uh, we are based in Rhode Island. And we have a team of in-house uh, electricians, project managers, et cetera, that uh, build projects for our own clients that we identify, develop projects for, and then also for uh, developers and owners uh, like CJ at Standard. Um, so we are very vocal and proud SolarEdge supporters. We actually just recently put a, about 138 KW system on our new headquarters here in Rhode Island. And I've got a system at home. So very happy with SolarEdge. Happy to be Thanks. here. Awesome. 
Thanks for the introduction. And uh, yeah, we've got some, I don't know, I don't want to call this dinosaurs, but it's almost like dog years in the solar industry, right? So we've, we've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of knowledge, a lot of expertise here. Um, so today's topic, obviously, we're all here to talk a little bit about ESG. It's a it's a, a to hot topic in the, in the news, in the print, in the media, and just uh, I thought I'd throw out some, some a little graph of just the the amount of, of companies you know introducing and incorporating their sustainability practices and putting it uh, formulated into a full process of implementation. So I don't know who the four percent are that are still waiting to do this, but uh, apparently there's there's a very small chunk uh, still waiting to, to jump on board, but it's definitely uh, here, present, and, and now. So one of the big things for us here at Solar Edge is, you know, just recently uh, we surpassed um, installations on over 50% of Fortune 100 companies on their rooftop. So we'll get into the discussion of, of uh, the details of that, but I'll would like to really kind of just jump into the, the, the panel conversation because we've got quite a few discussions here. So maybe Dr. Aurora, I'll start with you. Um, maybe high level, can you shed some light on just trends that you're seeing uh, within the universities like yours at, at the University of Pittsburgh or businesses uh, that are basically trying to incorporate to bolster their sustainability and social responsibility endeavors in the context of solar, right? Yeah, so uh, I'm not sure if colleges and universities uh, are representative sector for what's going on in sustainability uh, and ESG, um, but universities have obviously been leading in sustainability for a number of decades, incorporating um, first environment and then social justice uh, and then true sustainability into um, higher education curriculum you know, over the past several decades. Um, I sometimes say that sustainability is the work and ESG is how businesses talk about reporting on that work. Um, so sustainability within a higher education institution um, and nonprofit organizations in, in general, um, you know, it really hits those three legs, uh, environment, uh, equity and economics and really making sure that you're doing all three of those things uh, in everything that you do. Uh, just using the University of Pittsburgh as an example. Uh, our first sustainability plan was published in 2018. Uh, it has 68 goals across three different uh, themes and 15 impact areas, and it's really pretty robust. Everything from energy and emissions, which is where our carbon neutral um, and renewable electricity goals uh, show up, into um, goals about research, teaching, food systems, community partnerships, uh, and more. So I would say, you know, what we're doing is, is what a lot of universities are doing, really trying to think about how to do everything that we do a little bit better, uh, a little bit more in partnership, and considering the, that equity environment and economics in everything that we do. Um, the, the other part of that that I'll just mention is transparently reporting that. So we have public facing dashboards um, on everything from greenhouse gas emissions to food recovery to compost. Um, and you know we do regular reports, uh, just like a business would do ESG reporting um, on what we're doing on those vehicles. Awesome. The three E's, I like it. And there's, I mean, it's you're literally at the epicenter of all things sustainable. So it's um, it, it's great to hear. Uh, kind of switching gears a little bit, I'll go to uh, CJ. Um, I know you've got a, a tremendous amount of experience installing solar, uh, in addition to into, uh, installing Solar Edge uh, projects. But what? Um, I guess, can you share a little bit on your experience with integrating Solar Edge specifically into your projects and what benefits have you encountered? Or I don't know if you want to talk about the different features of Solar Edge's solutions that have proven to be most valuable uh, over the long term, uh, uh, you know, because you're now, you've made this migration of, you know, uh, got your experience in Nicaragua in the rainforest and now you're with Brookfield Renewables, it's, it's it's pretty broad spectrum there. So maybe just share a little bit about your experience with integrating uh, solar uh, in the projects. Yeah, I'd say that uh, we first were getting engaged with Solar Edge when we had to confront the rapid shutdown requirements within one foot of the PV array that were required by code. Uh, and then we've stayed 
with Solar Edge because of the reliability, the significant um, benefits from a safety standpoint, and really it being the state of the art system or solution for safe installation of solar PV systems on rooftops. Other for commercial applications. Mm -hmm. Other module level power electronics solutions have been excellent in the residential space, as has Solar Edge, but in the commercial space, in our experience, there really is no parallel that offers the same combination of total value uh, and benefits and safety uh, for the commercial space. Um, because Solar Edge is using an optimization technology rather than a microinverter technology, we're not trying to run long distances on large commercial roofs at um, AC output voltages that are in the 480 volt range, which would have significant voltage drop and significant losses and limited ability to control your DC to AC ratio um, when looking at projects. So with Solar Edge, if you're talking about the need to deploy module level power electronics for safety, um, data visibility, reliability, and code compliance on commercial scale applications, um, <clears throat> we just see a lot of value in the whole package that's being offered um, from the primary safety standpoint once we get the systems up and running we have an excellent uh, user interface for operational control and analysis of the data um, that's far more in depth than we get for our other types of projects that are using you know larger uh, string inverters or even central inverters on ground mounts and there is some significant value to that um, but for us um, we started with code compliance, and the reason that we've stayed with Solar Edge uh, over the years is because of its reliability and safety. And um, we just can't put another value higher than safety on that hierarchy when looking at uh, rooftop mounted solar PV. Awesome. Safety is uh, definitely paramount in, in today's age. Um, you know, Stuart, I guess from an EPC perspective, what are the key factors uh, typically, typically being considered uh, when you're evaluating solar energy solutions for, for larger scale projects with, you know, with sustainability and profitability in mind? Sure, yeah, a lot of the same uh, things that CJ touched on, I think, you know, from our perspective, the ease of install and also maintenance and service, I mean, that's definitely pretty important to us. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot a lot of training required to get up to speed on how to adopt Solar Edge back, you know, years ago when we first first started installing it. Uh, but, and, and over time, you know, of course, there's always failures with things and it's been very easy to maintain and swap out components, whether it be optimizers or, uh, synergy units. So that's definitely one of the main considerations. Performance is always really key, right? We want the system to perform and, and do what we say it was going to do for the customer. Uh, and in our case, for our own our own building here. So performance is definitely really important. Um, the quality and reliability of, of the inverters and the optimizers. Um, we've had you know, very few issues um, with this brand, definitely more uh, more with a lot of other brands out there. And that's one of the reasons we've stuck with, with Solar Edge, just the quality of the product. Um, things aren't missing in the box when it arrives. Um, that's definitely can hold us up and, and ends up costing time and money. Um, and then just the availability of the, the inverters. I mean, other than the uh, great COVID supply chain disruption, you know, Solar Edge is on the shelf and it's, it's ready for us to purchase and install. So those top four items are, are really what are keeping us going back to Solar Edge for uh, all of our rooftop projects. And we did have unique experience on a pretty large ground mount with Solar Edge as well, which was a positive one. And the same four um, top things applied to that project as well. Awesome. So it sounds like there's there's benefits for you guys as EPCs, uh, and also benefits for you know the end customer and user from a visibility monitoring perspective, uh, production energy harvest perspective, uh, design flexibility, etc. Um, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and go back to Dr. Aurora, but I'm kind of interested to know more about you know in the communication of environmental and social benefits related to solar. You talked about all the different metrics and reporting that you have at your fingertips to track uh, all the different initiatives that are being put out there. But how can enterprises uh, and EPCs effectively convey, convey these advantages to the 
wide, diverse stakeholders, investors, uh, board members, students, the local community, uh, based on your experience uh, at the university level? Sure. Um, I think sharing what you're doing is step one, right? A lot of people just put their heads down and do the work and never talk about the seemingly smaller pieces of the decision making, you know, sort of like the, the risk and safety aspects that, that both Stuart and CJ mentioned. A, a lot of people take those for granted, but they shouldn't, right? You have to say we did X, Y, and Z and make that part of your overall information sharing. Uh, I think the, the other pieces um, are, you know, setting goals helps. We see a lot of corporations and universities and governments now setting measurable time bound goals and then making that commitment is one thing, but coming behind and doing those regular updates on how you're doing, you know, what you're falling short on, what you're not, you know, what you still need help from the market or, or others on, I think is really important, just being honest and transparent um, about that because every other organization is struggling with those same things. Um, and then, you know, I've done a lot of work with data informed decision making, science based criteria, uh, setting standards and things like that. And, you know, sometimes the data that you have at your fingertips, even with, you know, rooftop solar, it's not necessarily the information that your user constituent, you know, customer needs and wants to see. So you have to figure out how to uh, communicate that bit to them, you know, some customers want to dig into solar edge app and know exactly what their daily production is and how that changes over time. And you know, we have students and faculty who want to do research on that and how that varies over time and geography. And you know, we have a 2012 array that has different angles on it, right? That, that the whole point was like, can you still generate power? You know, if you've got different angles, different orientations, things like that. So I think you have different types of users, and when you're sharing your progress and your journey, you have to tailor that message to the the people that you're talking to, and not just assume that everybody wants the same thing from your uh, information. And maybe just to add on to maybe backtrack a little bit, but like. I don't know, it seems like an instant, like universities or schools, it seems more uh, potential for, uh, you know, roadblocks or just the, the duration of, here's the idea of, we, we want to install solar, we want to incorporate it into the campus to actually implementation of the project. Can you give us a little perspective on, like, was that an arduous process? How did that how did you get to, here's the idea it's arduous, of yeah. <laughs> incorporating it into the buildings? It takes a while. I mean, not every owner university has the same opportunity, right? And, you know, not everybody has 150 buildings like, like Pitt does, right? Like some people might have one building and they're not going to re-roof that building for five years. So they have to be patient and wait and then make sure that solar would be included in that opportunity when you're looking at it across a campus or other building portfolio, you have to make the same determinations, right? And match what your strategy is going to be to the building or, or other ground uh, opportunity over time. And that takes a lot of patience. Uh, <laughs> it takes a lot of planning and strategy and, and partnership in, in large organizations. Um, at Pitt, we happen to be very well positioned in considering rooftop solar, looking at our existing building roof conditions pre-pandemic and then saying, oh, these are the ones that have good roofs now that we'd like to put solar on. And then these are the ones that are gonna be in the pipeline for re-roofing that we need to consider solar on. We, we took bids on six projects um, and did interviews the day after the Inflation Reduction Act got released, um, which as an institute, as a nonprofit state-related institution, uh, we're eligible for direct pay through the investment tax credit now which entirely changed our perspective on how we were going to financially deliver those projects um and so th that was one thing right like being well positioned asking the right questions and then the follow-on to that is being willing and able to put up the financial capital that you need to to get the federal benefit uh, from solar projects whether from the ptc or the itc uh, and also, if you're within a large organization, not just having your energy or sustainability or facilities planning strategy team be part of these conversations, but also getting your financial and tax offices on board, um, because their primary reason to do projects like this is very different <laughs> from, from why sustainability might do it. 
um, but making sure that you can capture those benefits and then redeploy those financial resources from uh, tax credits, direct pay, anything else, uh, electricity savings back within your organization in a way that makes sense uh, is really important a part of that project. So it sounds like the IRA was perfect timing for you. Yeah, it, it really was. Uh, <laughs> we were we were very nice in position. We're going to see, I mean, to your point about time, we're going to see the first project um, that'll be able to take advantage of those, even though we were such so well positioned, start to uh, be installed um, next month, so December, uh, even though we were we were right there um, over a year ago. So. Nice. Well, I'll, the next question, I'll, I'll, I'll open it up to either Stuart or CJ, or you guys can tackle it both together. But when integrating solar energy systems into existing enterprises, universities, institutions, infrastructure, what are the typical, not I don't want to, we know what all the challenges are, I think, but where do you see the opportunities to expedite the process uh, and overcome those? Like, what are your recommendations for the Fortune 100, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies, or even if it's a mom and pop shop, like, that has a more of a regional basis and you're, you're looking to deploy solar, what what recommendations uh, do you have for those entities? I'd be happy to kick that off. I think that we have to start by managing expectations and being realistic about where the risks lie and who owns what area of risk during the project development and implementation process. Um, as a system owner, we're taking risk on the construction, the development, the long-term operation, and the productivity of the system. And as a customer, they're taking more of the risk on tariff changes, electricity rate fluctuations, and some risk on what the expected or projected savings are over the term of that agreement. Um, so recognizing where the di different areas of risk lie, what the goals are, is your goal really just to save money and you want to be able to put the green tag on there um, and, and say it's sustainable or is your primary goal sustainability and how does that drive your approach to implementing renewable energy for on-site use into your portfolio of, of buildings or, or facilities? Uh, and then recognizing that you just can't copy and paste everywhere. It is the incentives, especially for distributed generation solar, vary dramatically from state to state and location to location and uh, you have to look at the different types of buildings and facilities you have and look for different approaches for those different sites in some states an off-site solution may be more cost effective and a faster way to reach your goals where in other places um, on site on rooftop could be the best solution um, but it all depends on what you're looking for what are your goals how high profile do you want your projects to be? Are you focused on sustainability? Are you focused on saving? Are you focused on public perception? All those things affect the development approach. And I'll add to that, you know, we, we're firm believers in, in kind of always planning and being prepared for solar down the road, whether you're ready now or not. I think it's really important for any organization to uh, think about, you know, what are we going to need for a solar project, whether it's next year or five years down the road? One of the worst things that can happen is we run into frequently is organization just finished a brand new building or a two-year-old building, and um, you know the, the the roof wasn't specced properly. So we can't, you know, we either can't install solar, or we got to jump through a bunch of expensive hoops to try to get the solar installed, or we're retrofitting and running conduits in places that are less than ideal. It could have been well concealed with a little bit of planning. So it's, we think it's really important to, you know, whether you're ready or not, just at least include uh, this, this in the discussion with the design team and with the other stakeholders, um, just so that when you're ready, uh, the kind of the building is solar ready uh, and you eliminate some cost down the road. I'd say you put a little bit of cost in up front and you can save multiples of that down the road in um, you know, eliminating roadblocks and additional expensive challenges. So I think that's really important for, for every new project. Like I said, whether you're ready now or not, just, just getting that bug in the, in the design team and the stakeholders ear uh, to try to make sure you'll have a successful project and the most cost effective project down the road. 
I just want to underscore that we have three buildings right now that we weren't ready to do solar on five years ago, and now we're coming behind and <laughs> thank goodness they're solar ready because we're just layering it on there. And then, you know, with every re-roof, we're asking for solar uh, as an adult to consider it. Not everything fits for any number of reasons you know it's in conflict with mechanical systems and green roof aspirations and setbacks and everything else but if you don't ask the question you're, you're never going to know if it if it is a match yeah absolutely so it's not, not a question of if you're going to do it it's when you're going to do it in the preparation uh beforehand for it so uh along similar lines like how do you compare you know there's, there's esg and there's, there's still i don't know not a whole lot of like here's like Sarbanes Oxley, like a publicly traded company. There's set requirements. There, there's governance over it, process to it, um, which you know I think will again start to migrate into ESG a little bit. But how would you compare like ESG, you know, the drive to to, to be more sustainable, governance reported versus net zero? Right? Um, you know, what is your perspective on those kind of two terminologies? And it's kind of an open question for anybody. I'll take a stab at it um, and then others can go. Um, so I don't like to think about compliance. I, I feel like in sustainability, green buildings, world renewables, if you're simultaneously like fighting the floor and reaching for the stars, like it, it's too hard. Right, you really want to always be reaching for the stars. So, like, if you're an organization that's just looking at compliance right now, you're already behind. Um, so, thinking out to the future, you know, is there going to be a you know price on carbon uh, in the U.S.? You know, if you're a global company, you're already looking at that uh, around the world in different ways. So, so what does that mean um, in in the future, and how can you take advantage of that while simultaneously mitigating your risk? Um, there is a lot of terminology out there, net zero energy site source, uh, carbon neutrality, what's your boundary? You know, are you reporting greenhouse gas emissions for scope one, two, or three? I think the first thing to do there is to get started, <laughs> to set a goal, to start tracking the information, reporting the information, be honest about what you have and what you don't have and understand that the perfect is the enemy of the good in these conversations, right? You may not be able to put solar on every building in your portfolio, but if you start with every new building or solar ready, like what Stuart said, um, then you're sort of picking away at it, you know, bit by bit. Uh, CJ's point about um, partnering both, you know, on-site and off-site is a really good one. Uh, I could, I'd love to talk about our, our rooftop solar projects because they're nice, they're visible, you know, I don't have transmission and distribution losses for those, but we also have a partnership with Vesper on um, the largest uh, solar farm in southwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, it's only 20 megawatts, Pennsylvania's behind in this realm, um, but we're the sole off taker uh, for that and it's less than 25 miles from campus, right? So looking for those unique opportunities and understanding that they might be financial, they might be environmental, they might be social, and that the sweet spot is all three of those and sharing that information with your stakeholder base. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I'd like to uh, expand upon that. You know, I really see ESG is kind of the buzzword, but environmental, uh, social uh, equity and, and, and inclusion, and then governance policies that align with all of that is really just a set of goals and policies that your company or organization is striving towards, not just for compliance. It should be more of this is what we're trying to do, this is how we're defining what we as an organization are doing to meet our environmental, social, and governance approaches. And meeting net zero or carbon uh, net zero in your operations is one of the key sub-goals to meeting that. And I think that particular goal is talked about so much because it contributes to all three areas. It contributes to your environmental sustainability. It contributes to proper equity and, and social responsibility within your community, and then it's consistent with the governance policies that most people are looking for that an organization or corporation should be complying with in order to be consistent with what they're setting as their goals and saying that their stated purpose is. And I work on a university campus, so it's easy for me to say this. 70% of all incoming students and their parents are interested in what their universities are doing relating to the environment specifically. That's an indicator for 
who your next employee is could potentially be as a company, right? So if you're trying to attract that person to your company, like this generation on college campuses is very interested in sustainability. They've sort of grown up in an era of lead certified buildings, rooftop solar, carbon neutral commitments. They're looking for that from their future employer and they want to know what what's more than just showing up every day and doing the job. How are they doing good in the world? And I would just add on to CJ's point about you know net zero and the aspiration for net zero. Obviously, we all need to get there, um, but I think it, a key thing to keep in mind for anyone considering solar or other other uh, energy related goals is to just take whatever bite you can because it's definitely going to help the greater good. Um, you know, getting to to zero energy or net zero is not an easy task. And, Rarely are the economics that much different from say 50% to 90% to 100%. Obviously, you're still going to have a, a financial uh, burden there if you're less than less than fully offsetting your your energy use. But uh, every bit helps. So I think it's really it's important to strive for net zero. But just do do what you can, and it'll certainly uh, make strides for the greater good. Awesome. Interesting. Well, uh, it, interesting, the 70% statistic of new incoming students, you said, Dr. Aurora? That, that's uh, a higher number than I, I suspected. So with incoming students, I mean, in what ways uh, is the existing solar site on campus or sites on campus and the, the farm 25 miles down the road, how are you incorporating, incorporating education into that? into the curriculum or is there courses under development that focuses on renewable energy uh, whether it's engineering whether it's the finance side whether it's the sales side whether it's the operation maintenance side of it is there is there talk or discussion of incorporating educational purposes into the actual sites that you do have today yeah so um the way that uh, sustainability education and research work that, at universities is, you know, we try to embed, we say sustainability related or sustainability focused um, projects, curriculum, you know, lectures into every class at the university. You know, we're, we're not there yet, <laughs> but the idea that you could teach um, an economics class and, you know, incorporate environmental and social indicators in that makes sense, right? Like that, that's what we all do on a, on a daily basis. We should be teaching our, our next generation of professionals that same thing. Uh, but sustainability is an interdisciplinary thing by nature. Right, so while there are obviously renewable energy classes, you know, it has a sustainability undergraduate certificate and a sustainable business micro credential and sustainable engineering masters, like all sorts of different programs, just like every other university, um, because that's what students want, and then that's what you know organizations and you know their their future employers need them to to be doing it and thinking about. I think the, the real question is um, a lot of universities talk about using campuses as a living laboratory and as an 18 year old stepping foot on a college campus. But one of the largest things that they want to do is make an input an impact in what is essentially their, their new city, right? Their, their first place as, a, as an adult really being able to, to show how they're a, a responsible and influencing citizen. And so universities give students that opportunity in a lot of different ways. Sometimes a rooftop solar array that people can't see or a partnership with um, a, you know, a solar developer 20 miles from campus is a little bit far away. So figuring out how you can make things you know, like the same person scale um, in this result um, is really important. So you know, at Pitt, we have things like pollinator gardens and you know, rain gardens and things like that. Um, but also we have solar picnic tables. Um, and, that, and there's a push for like other person scale solar just to raise awareness about what we're doing in other places that people can't see and touch on a regular basis. And then creating that as an educational and research opportunity is the ongoing opportunity. Nice. And I would say, I mean, Solar Edge has got a pretty powerful, uh, we, we collect a tremendous amount of data, right? We, we collect module data, string data, inverter data, data, grid level data to very, fine resolution so there's there's definitely there's benefits for educational purposes there to understand kind of the, the, the crux of the technology but maybe Stuart or CJ uh, since you're, you're more hands-on involved with, with Solar Edge in terms of like monitoring maintenance what features Solar Edge's solution have been 
proven to be the most valuable in ensuring the long-term uh, reliability of, of your of your fleet infrastructure. Sure, yeah, I'll kick that one off. Um, the the monitoring portal, like CJ mentioned earlier, it's you know it's it's more advanced than than some of the you know competing inverter models out there, uh, our manufacturers. It's um, it's definitely improved over the years, and it's definitely helped us you know pinpoint. Uh, any production related issues, hardware related issues, module failures are, are pretty low based on you know the technology we're using, but they do occur and Solar Edge definitely helps us identify them pretty quickly. Um, all the detailed data you just spoke of, all the collection on grid level data down to the panel level, I mean, it's extremely helpful when we're trying to uh, commission the system and then when we're trying to just monitor and, and operate these for, for years on end, just to see, um, you know, where are, if, if there are issues, are they at the grid side, or are they within the array? Um, and on top of that, the, the field support team from Solar Edge has been very helpful and kind of, you know, bringing us up to speed whenever there's changes to the portal and when we need a little extra support, Solar Edge is um, both the remote team on the support line and also the, the local uh, field technicians are extremely helpful. So I definitely want to give everyone credit there on that end, not just the developers of the uh, monitoring portal, but definitely a very valuable tool, something that's you know, easily accessible here at the office and, and obviously out in the field on smartphones and laptops. Um, so that is a, a great feature and definitely a feature that's uh, keeping us to come back for more. Yeah, to add on to that, um, as an asset manager and asset owner, you have to think about what's going to happen with the system over the long term. One thing that uh, the Solar Edge Module Level Power Electronics uh, technology allows you to do is it prevents differential degradation of the modules and of the system affecting the entire system. And also, if we have an individual module that fails, we're not worried about how that replacement is going to react with the rest of the equipment on site because with module level power electronics, you're isolating that section of the system. And that takes you through the life of the system and how you're gonna manage it and maintain that system throughout the, its service life. And at the beginning of the project, the technology helps you because it gives you more design flexibility, allows you to have adjustable different string sizes, especially for complex or unique groups. You're not bound by a specific string size to hit your target voltage, otherwise you're gonna sacrifice production on the rest of your array or reduce your, your target um, MPPT voltage for the rest of the system. You're not worried about voltage degradation over time. So there's a lot of uh, interesting advantages that you can glean from that um, that allow for better project Im implementation and then management of the asset over the long term. Yeah, I'll just echo that point about um, you know replacing modules down the road. Solar Edge definitely makes that uh, kind of eliminates that worry. So anyone who's had to try to find a physically and electrically compatible module for a seven or plus year old solar array, it's uh, you can spend weeks trying to find something. So just eliminating that worry right at the front end um, and simplifying it when it actually does happen is, is definitely very valuable. Yeah, so it sounds like you use it a lot for, for operations and maintenance and digging into, I mean, uh, how often do customers get into it, do you see? Or are they trying to keep it more high level, hey, here's what I produced today, or I'm in line with what my anticipated production was this month? Uh, or you know, what's the, what's the separation there as far as you know, knowledge? Do you spread that knowledge to the end customers? Yeah, so with our customers, I mean, we let them get involved as they want to be. They obviously have access to the monitoring portal. Uh, we offer training at the end of the, the project to make sure everyone on their team's up to speed and how to use it. I'd say a handful of our customers, and maybe to put it percentage-wise, maybe 10 to 15 percent end up, you know, linking that into their their website somehow. Um, and I'd say a, a majority, probably more than 50 percent, use it for some type of monthly reporting. Uh, I've done a lot of projects for the state of Rhode Island, including a few for the National Guard, uh, and they definitely use it for their uh, Department of Defense directives as far as reporting performance and savings. Um, so it's su super easy to use, and it's it's definitely, I'd say, used by more customers than not. Um, and they, of course, just love the peace of mind that, you know, there's alerts and we get alerts if there's ever issues. So 
uh, downtime is obviously kept to a minimum that way. So awesome. linking this to like our carbon neutrality reporting, you know, we pull information on every current and future array annually. Uh, you know, we do look at our monthly, you know, pings <laughs> from from rooftops array arrays and and what what's going on from them. Uh, and as EPA Green Power Partner, we also report to them uh, on what each of our uh, rooftop arrays are doing. Um, so we do pull the data. We uh, for our newest um, array at, on the Pitt Bradford campus, um, we are developing a dashboard you know, for that building, like like Stuart said. It's a faculty and student developed dashboard, which is which is great. And then we'll integrate that and put that live on our website also because you know our stakeholders are interested in, in these things that they can't necessarily see and touch themselves, but they want to know like how they're doing it and dig into the details. Yeah, is it uh, just out of curiosity? You have all these. You mentioned various dashboards that you use. Um, how many, like from an electrical perspective? Do, I mean, do you guys have electric vehicles on site? Are you measuring? Um, uh, you know, you're obviously measuring um, uh, the production results, but are there other mechanics that you're looking at HVAC systems, other electrically big large motors that on site that you're you're tracking from a metric perspective yeah so the the, so the world of sustainability data is vast and there are way too many data points and data owners especially within um large organizations uh so sort of whittling your question down to the built environment um you know there are data feeds on every building just using our pittsburgh campus as an example we have over 900,000 points uh, sensed through our building automation system. We're actually tying our rooftop solar uh, installs into that BAS backnet uh, also, so we can see them as part of the, the whole, but then also, you know, I don't run that system. Uh, so I can see our arrays through like my solar edge portal or my Enphase uh, portal for my older uh, rooftop arrays um, as well. Uh, and then we can pull that information and, and integrate it um, online through dashboards and things like that, however we like. Sometimes it's hard to report, while different departments really do care about all the details, right? Facilities and you know, utilities care about you know, the, the solar production, transportation and parking care about EV charging, you know, rates, utilization and everything there. Not everybody necessarily needs to be in all the details of everybody else's work. They're just interested in the, the roll up. Um, Awesome. So kind of pivoting back to, um, you know, balancing sustainability and profitability, it's often, you know, can be very challenging. Uh, kind of open question for anybody, but can you share any specific strategies or examples of how uh, your projects uh, in particular uh, have basically balanced those two aspects of, you know, achieving sustainability, but also achieving profitability and making this financially viable you're muted cj yeah you're i thought it was me at first <laughs> that's right so sorry i wanted to go back sure. <laughs> i wanted to go back to the point of combination of on-site and off-site solar um, with on-site solar, you have your benefits of your visibility and um, uh, local benefits, but then your off-site is really where your lower cost and your high value uh, solar can come from. So when you're looking at that combination, you can get a more holistic approach. Uh, for on-site solar, it's very difficult to meet 100% of the building's energy needs on its own roof. Unless it's a large warehouse that doesn't really have heating and cooling, it's very hard to do. Um, the technology just doesn't have a high enough energy density to be able to deliver that. So you need to have multiple sources in order to offset all of that uh, demand and to deliver it. So looking at the combination of offsite and onsite and standard solar provides that for our company, our customers, because we do distributed generation solar, we do carports, rooftops, we also do ground mounts, and about 50% of our capacity is community solar or virtually metered uh, projects. Um, so we look at the whole thing and you really have to take a, uh, an approach of both on and off-site in order to meet your goals. 
I just want to underscore what CJ said, you know, if we did every rooftop on our Pittsburgh campus, which is very urban with solar, which we can't for a number of reasons, I would still be under 10% of our annual electricity usage. <laughs> so, which is why we have to partner on offsite um, renewable power purchase agreements. Uh, that said, I had an engineer try to talk me out of rooftop solar on a project the other day because it was only covering 30% of the building's electricity and our answer was essentially it doesn't matter <laughs> right there's room for solar on this rooftop it's a very energy intensive building we want it to happen as the owner we run the financial numbers it has a good payback we use a social cost of carbon that matches the federal government's cost of carbon in our payback uh, assessments of that and our CFO and board of trustees are on board with that method and how we do it and we run all energy efficiency carbon project through that same lens. So I think it's just getting all those stakeholders involved and of course getting that capital <laughs> behind all of it to, to make it happen. Um, because without that capital, you know, a lot of the smaller nonprofits and governments looking at, for instance, the Inflation Reduction Act's investment tax credit right now may not have the upfront capital to wait for that direct pay to come back to them from a tax credit. So the question of how to how to bridge that financing gap for them, I think is really important. Um, yeah, just because different institutions have different capital at their disposal and different decision making thresholds that it, that it has to run through. Yeah, I'm so sorry. So, uh, I was just going to say, I'm surprised to hear that 30 percent, uh, the engineer wasn't too excited about that. I mean, 30 percent, that's a pretty good bite. Three percent. OK, well, uh, I can see his point, but but there is the added benefit of you know distributed generation. Is you're using that power generated right on site and doing your part, you know, eliminating those uh, losses along the utility. So yeah, three is a bit lower than thirty, but uh, still, I think echoing my point from earlier, whether it's three percent or or hundred percent, you're still doing a, a good thing, and and the economics are very similar, although the remaining bill may be a lot different. Yeah, and 3% of an office building is a lot different than 3% of a laboratory building. We're talking about laboratory building. So, yeah. It's still so kill a lot hours. Yeah. If you're looking at total energy, and then if you only look at offsite, which is the the low cost, really, you know, hard hitting numbers where you can get high volume and deliver savings, you're walking away from a lot of benefits and you might find yourself on the outside looking in in the long term because. Um, off-site solar does not allow you to build in resiliency to your energy infrastructure on-site for outages and other issues. Off-site solar does not allow you to benefit from the use of energy storage in the long term. It doesn't allow you to integrate it into your entire building management and um, you know enterprise energy management systems. It's really just a virtual source of renewable energy you as the off taker are essentially sponsoring that project and allowing it to happen by providing a credit worthy long term off take but you don't have as much ownership and intimate relationship as you do with the system that is posted on your own facility or your own property and i think today we don't see a lot of solar plus storage behind the meter but it's growing and it will continue to grow i'm sure stuart sees it uh, more and more as are we and as the markets mature and uh, we see the distribution grid become more uh, sophisticated and also congested with other renewables and variable sources of energy, it's going to become essential for organizations like uh, Pittsburgh and other uh, institutions um, to have on-site energy generation, energy storage, and integration into their entire energy management system. Yeah, that's a perfect point. Um, I will say all of the rooftop solar that we've given a green light to to date is not dependent on demand savings uh, for those buildings. So, you know, so to the three percent, I've got a bunch of demand charges on that building <laughs> that I'm not taking into account. It still looks good, so I'm gonna have more savings. I would love to see the building scale battery market come along a little bit faster, CJ. <laughs> uh, we had one project that we that we had enough financial information on so far to even consider. Um, and we continue to look for other opportunities, but there, there's not a lot um, out there so far uh, in, in an urban um, implementation. Well, I got a couple more questions. Um, 
maybe just like thinking uh, the road ahead, the future at the next couple of years, or what you're excited about, uh, thinking about you know collaborative initiatives or partnerships that excite you between developers, universities, enterprise businesses to deploy more solar. What do you see as uh, any, anything new, exciting is in regards to collaborative initiatives or, or partnerships? It takes takes an army sometimes to put everything together. I don't know about new, but I would say for every project you do and every customer you work with, you have to give them your best. You have to make sure they understand what it is that they're getting into and you're managing their expectations. If you deliver a quality safe system with good customer service you're going to win over another advocate and that's really what we need is we need more folks who are on the nonpartisan side of this is the right thing to do no matter what else you're working on and what else you think and i think that's really can be exciting when you win another advocate to to support the growth of renewables and drive to net zero and you know effort to meeting esg goals In Pennsylvania, we've seen the Pennsylvania Solar Center work with organizations to help them collaborate and put out, you know, shared RFPs um, for rooftop arrays. Uh, no community solar in Pennsylvania is approved yet, but we're looking forward to it. Um, and so I think that's a, a future trend that we expect more of is this collaborative purchasing and procurement um, strategy. Maybe we, we've seen it happen with universities at the power purchase agreement level, uh, not at the rooftop level yet, but you know, the government, that smaller nonprofit collaboration is, is exciting. I would also say that the uh, solar developers and, and solar system owners are always on the front lines of working with utilities on integration and interconnection into the infrastructure. But when you have the backing of a very important large energy user behind you that also wants to see the project be successful, they have better influence and it's also showing that what we're doing is not just for the benefit of some developer and system owner, it's for the development of the community or a key organization that wants to meet their goals and deliver all the values that renewable energy can provide uh, to a community. And then you're not just being stonewalled necessarily by uh, a utility or other uh, stakeholders. You're, you can get some more support and see some interesting uh, reactions when they see you know what the real end goal is in the big picture absolutely well we're running up uh, on the hour here got just a few minutes left um maybe i'll turn the tables around here a little bit and see i've been asking a lot of the questions but i don't know Stuart, dr aurora cj do you guys have any questions for me or solar edge If not, I, I, I caught you off guard. <laughs> well, I got one for you. Um, you know, with the Brookfield's acquisition of Standard Solar, um, we are very focused on ESG policies and goals, and we're pushing that down to our vendors as well. So we have a whole vendor code of conduct. We have ESG reporting policies going to our vendors, and um, we also have, you know, detailed governance uh, requirements as well, um, because you know, as a as an investment, that's important to our investors and our stakeholders as well. So I guess I would ask, what are Solar Edge's primary ESG goals and policies, and what are you all doing to, you know, improve your supply chain? Yeah, hundred percent. Great, great question. So uh, SolarEdge.com, uh, we've got a whole sustainability uh, page on this topic, and it has all our different. I mean, we we publicize and report just. Like I said earlier, we're a publicly traded company, so all their financial disclosures are out there in addition to our, our sustainability, uh, environmental responsibility uh, metrics that we track. So in, here at Solar Edge, we're, we're committed to quality and environmental responsibility, and that's reflected a lot in our, our, our manufacturing process. So, I don't know the exact numbers, but we definitely, just like you are pressing it upon the manufacturers, and then we also have supply agreements with our suppliers. We are also enforcing, you know, 
uh, quality sustainability with our heat suppliers. I mean, there's there's hundreds of them, right? Um, all our manufacturing and research and development sites are certified ISO standards. Uh, um, not too technical on, on that aspect of it, but that's basically you know ISO standards for quality and, and safety and uh, we've achieved hundred percent certification in that arena so it ensures that our operations adhere to the highest industry standards on quality the environment sustainability and also safe place safety as well because it is a manufacturing facility so but there is a very detailed multi-page report that we we put out every single year i'll send you a copy I hope and, and hopefully we meet all of your standards if not exceeding. So it's definitely uh, just excited to see what's to come with Blue Ridge, um, especially on the energy storage front on the larger scale projects. Um, and yeah, just proud proud supporter here, happy to be a part of it and uh, doing our thing here for the next generation. Yeah, absolutely. John, well, I can say I sat in on two bids yesterday for rooftop solar projects, and both the installers were effusive about Solar Edge in a way that I had not realized. Um, so that's fun. You're getting some good feedback uh, out in the field. Yeah. yeah, for us, I mean, it's uh, like you've all noted, right? I mean, it's uh, rooftop solar safety is, is paramount. You know, I'm so thankful that the the founders of Solar Edge had the foresight to not fear their original strategy. Uh, framework for building the technology and not to you know cut costs and you know uh, do the kind of uh, the typical hamster wheel of, of uh, you know, cutting costs and making a cheap product right it, it, safety is definitely paramount in, in what we do and uh, it's important for for the asset owners the universities the enterprise businesses out there you know the actual asset owners like CJ and Standard Solar that, that own these systems long term, and then you know Stuart for your teams that are actually hands on, physically touching, building and constructing these sites. Uh, it's safety for your your environment as well. So um, I really appreciate everybody taking the time to uh, to join uh, today's conversation um, and the panelists. A big thank you for taking the time out of your busy days i know it's, it's the end of the year there's a lot of activities that are going on so uh thank you very very much and like i said at the beginning of this call uh we'll be sending out uh additional information on on this topic uh, to all this to all that joined or, or registered as well as a copy of of the recording so again cj Stuart, dr aurora i very much appreciate your time and and your insight and knowledge in, in today's conversation so with that uh I'll, I'll give everybody a couple minutes back of their their day and uh, enjoy the rest of the week thanks for having me yeah thanks for having me john thanks guys take care bye